So we're going to start to go week two over again, <laughs> and we're just going to start out with the PowerPoint. Then we're going to be going to the cahoots, and hopefully we'll be getting over that. I know one of the students hasn't returned yet. I understand that, but Justin will catch up. I know he will. So let's just go ahead and start our PowerPoint. And don't worry, I'm going to give you something that doesn't take more than 15 minutes to do, and we'll grade you on that. Um, maybe I'll do it on fine motor or gross motor, something from this week to get you caught up, or maybe I'll ask you something about infants, okay? And what is their uh, pre, uh, progress uh, sequence of events, you know, that developmental sequence type thing? I'll do something like that. I'll make something. So there's no um, option to keep the grade that we got on the quiz. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine says that I have a five out of 10, so I have a terrible grade on it, so. Out of 10. Well, I don't know what all anyway. I, I'm, okay. <laughs> I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll try to figure it out and let y'all know. I've never had that happen before. So that was uh, different for me. So, anyway, infants, toddlers, preschoolers, chapters 31, 32, 33, packed full of information. You know, kids, if you think about it, how quickly do they grow, right? So, infants, we know it's the early stage, that first year of life, 28 days of life, you're called a neonate, okay? After that, up to one year, you're an infant. So there's a difference in names there. But if you can imagine, a child cannot even lift their head at birth. And by one year old, a lot of them are running and walking, right? And feeding themselves. It's amazing. Children go from their birth weights, triple it by a year old. I mean, and they're growing one inch every month for the first six months. So they're growing really fast also. So if we don't feel fuel the body with nutrition, just like if you don't put gas in the car, it's not going to get up and go, right? It's going to fall behind. And that's what happens with infants. That's why if you think about it, why do we weigh a child every time they go to the doctor's office? We do a height and we do a weight. We wanna make sure, are they gaining weight? Are they getting that nutrition that fuels their tank so that their body can be cognitively and their motor skills can all follow suit? Because if they are lacking, they're behind developmentally slow, then we can look at it, is it due to nutrition? So initially they're gonna lose weight, right? you know, 10%, and then they start gaining weight, five to seven ounces, they double by six months, born at seven pounds, six months, they're 14 pounds, and they should be about triple their weight, like 21 pounds at one year old, again, one inch per month for six months, and again, it's like up and up, you'll see them getting pudgier, and they'll get taller, pudgier and taller, <laughs> When infants are born, their heart rates are 140 to 160. By the time they hit one year, it could be about 100 to 120 is their normal heart rate. So why? Well, the body becomes more efficient. It doesn't have to beat as fast. They don't have to breathe as fast. Now, one thing that we need to remember about infants is babies are born with mommy's immune system and mommy's blood. So mommy's hemoglobin and hematocrit. If mommy's hemoglobin hematocrit was good at birth, you got a good start because babies do not start making their own cells till about five or six months old. So what happens? Cells die. That's normal. So what happens to the hemoglobin hematocrit? It decreases, decreases, and decreases. It is not uncommon for a six-month-old to have a nine or 10 hemoglobin where it should be what? 13 or 14, right? That's absolutely normal. And remember, what does the hemoglobin do? It carries oxygen and it carries iron. So if the iron isn't there, it's because it's the hemoglobin, right? Because you need the hemoglobin to get it around. Now, their heads, they're born with big heads. I call them blockheads. Remember when I saw my first son, my firstborn, I was like, oh my God, he's got this blockhead on him. But I didn't realize that time that infants had the bigger heads because I wasn't working pediatrics then. So what happens? That big head is there and it's going to grow, but they have little spaces in there called fontanelles. They have the anterior and posterior fontanelle, and those are the soft spots. 
they always say, be careful. Don't let the other kids punch them. And, you know, um, they can get damaged in their brain because their brain is right there. Now, you will see their posterior close about six to eight weeks. So by two months old, that, you know, posterior should be closed. The anterior could be closing about 12 to 18 months. Now, they say an average about 14. Now, we can tell if it's closing too quick, the brain doesn't have room. Now, if it's closing too quick also, um, you know, why is it closing so quick? We got to find out why and, you know, make sure that there's room there. And if this head circumference keeps getting bigger and bigger and the fontanelles are doing what they're doing, maybe it's something like hydrocephalus or water, extra water on the brain, right? Or maybe brain tumors. And little infants do get brain tumors, unfortunately. So it's something to look at. Another thing that's at birth is babies are born with not great vision. They even say that black and white mobiles are fine as long as they're colorful, black and white. They don't see colors as much. As they get older, you're going to see that one eye and the other eye, they don't work together. Like if you put your finger up, your both eyes look at it, right? And then you could tell depth perception. With an infant, you have one eye and the other eye. So that depth perception, reaching, they can't do it yet. And that's usually somewhere about six months up to about you know a year, you're about normal. So remember that as they're trying to grab that rattle from you, that infant, they don't have that depth perception yet. So you almost have to put it in their hand, okay? Their central nervous system. I mean, this is their growing. This is their movement. This is their cognition. It is growing like crazy. Again, they're lifting their head up by two months old. They're turning from their abdomen to back, back to abdomen by six months old. Then they're crawling, creeping, walking. I mean, there's so many things they do. It's because of the nervous system growing and maturing and giving that body those impulses to be able to do those things. Their immune system, we know we're born with mom. Now, why do we give so many immunizations? Did anybody look at the book and see a double page of immunizations and go, oh my God, how am I gonna remember all these things? Well, you don't have to remember all of them, okay? There's some key ones as we go along that I will tell you which ones, but just remember immunizations in an infant, we're giving at two months, four months, six months, 12 months, 15 months, 18 months, two years. It's like we are giving them all of this protection because what's happening to mommy's immune system? It's going away. So we need to protect them from those bad things. You know, when a baby um, gets to be about nine months old and getting those little colds and flus and, you know, the little virus type things, they're building up their own immunities. You know, I see a lot of like ear infections and little upper respiratories in the small little ones. Um, but again, the body's building those immune systems for it. We know their GI tract is protected as infants. And when they're born, they could have what we call this cheese is what I call it, this vernix caseosa. It's like a cheese that covers them. And that's actually a protection that they're born with. Now, what do infants do in the body, in mom? They are floating around in fluid. So they come out and they're just a little bit bloated. Um, their tissue is full of fluid and they cannot regulate themselves at all, their temperature. So what do we do? We immediately put them under a radiant warmer, right? At a mom, under the radiant warmer, we wipe them off um, because we don't want them to get cold, okay? We, there's, they cannot recover from that. They need something to warm them up. Their renal system is still mature. Um, how do we know if their kidneys are working? Well, we look at wet diapers. Right. If you have six to eight wet diapers a day, we know we're doing good and we know we're getting proper feed. How do we weigh a diaper? How do we know urine output? Well, if you have a size one diaper, it weighs 30 grams. And if you take it off the baby after they've peed or pooped or whatever in it and you weigh it and it's 60 grams, there's 30 grams difference. That is 30 mLs of urine. Very easy. So figuring out output is very easy. Just a measuring, just subtract whatever size diaper, and that is your output. 
<clears throat> at birth, their GI system is so immature. So initially, they can't tolerate anything but milk or iron fortified formula. Now, even up to, you know, the first year of life, you might see pieces of food in their stool. It's just because their GI system can't tolerate it yet. I mean, we know at six months, we're gonna start feeding these infants some um, food. That's part of it, I'm gonna get into that, but not all of it do they tolerate it. And you'll see it in their stool and it's normal. Now, the babies that are earlier, like zero to six months, you're going to see it in the stool because the GI tract cannot tolerate it at all. But again, at six months, it gets ready to, and prepared. We start with rice cereal and they do really well with it. Now there's two types of motor development, fine F fingers. So fine motor is F fingers, it's all about what they do with their hands, okay? So what do we do? Well, the first thing they do is mommy puts her little finger and the little baby just puts her hand around it. It's a reflex grasp, but mommy says, oh, look, the baby's hugging my finger. It's a reflex, don't tell them. They want to think that the baby is knowing who mommy is, okay? After that, they get into what we call a voluntary grasp. They'll take that rattle out of your hand because that's a voluntary. Then it goes into pincer, which is using the fingers and fine, you know, motor skills, we start out with a crude. Now, I call it this. You put a kid in a high chair and you put out those little puffs or Cheerios and they sort of smush their hand and sort of smush it in their mouth. That's the crude. Then all of a sudden they take their two little fingers and they take one and as they get older. And that's the really refined. So it's crude pincer and then a regular pincer. Then by about 11 months old, they can remove stuff from containers or put into the containers. And then by one year, they can make a block tower of two blocks. Now, do some kids do more? Of course. Do some kids do less? Of course, because all kids are different. And there's something for you to test yourself. Now, gross motor, okay? G, go. Get up and go, go, go like Paw Patrol. That's movement. That's motor. That's moving, that's muscles. That's something that they're going to be moving with. What does it start with? It starts with the head lifting up. That's your first gross motor development. And that's about two months old, they should do it. By five months, they should be able to roll from their belly to their back and six months back to belly. Now, at this point, these children must be secured if they're laying on any flat surface. I cannot tell you how many infants at that age I saw being brought into the ER because they were on the bed and they rolled off or they were on the changing table, rolled off. They were on the couch and they rolled off and the, they went into a wood floor, a tile floor, cement floor, and the parents were concerned. So this is something safety we will teach them. Sitting unsupported should be about eight months old. And then they are able about 10 months to go from their back, get up, I mean, from their tummies, get up on their knees and sit down. And then they sit again, unsupported. Now, do you see that top right picture as we're holding those hands up for the younger baby, the head lags backwards? Now that should disappear by two months old. And as you could see the second picture, they're coming up with it, right? That means they're getting more muscles in their necks and in their, in their muscles are working. Now, if a baby is not being able to bring their head up when you pull them by about four months old, there's a problem. They are developmentally delayed and the physician needs to be aware and they need some sort of early intervention. In this case, it could be physical therapy. So nutrition, like I said, and I'm gonna say this because I say it all the time, nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. The baby doesn't get nutrition, they're not gonna grow and they're not gonna think, they just don't. So again, that's why we weigh these children every visit. Now we do believe breastfeeding at least for the first six months up to one year and then, you know, they don't have to be breastfed like that as much. Now, some um, mothers for whatever reason don't wanna breastfeed at least they're gonna get iron fortified formula. And there's difference in what the stools look like with these children and actually how long they're gonna sleep. Now, 
a breastfed baby should have six to eight wet diapers. And you're going to see a lot of stool, like seedy, yellow, really loose. On the iron fortified formula, it's going to be a little bit thicker and not as much. It's just part of that. Also, formula babies do sleep a little longer than breastfed babies because breastfeeding, they consider that milk a clear liquid, okay? So it's not as thick and full of things like the uh, formula, just to let you know, because parents will ask you. <coughs> the baby should gain all that, you know, extra fluid, extracellular fluid and that body weight they lose, which is 10%, they should gain it back within two weeks. I mean, this is how quick they're eating, 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 eating. So they should be gaining about 15 grams per day in the first two months of life. So they're gaining weight like crazy, right? That's why they're gonna double their birth weight by six months. And breastfed babies should have vitamin D, all about muscles and joints and making them work good. Now the second six months, the, the GI system's a little bit better. So we're gonna start to introduce food. They say the first food you should um, introduce because it's better tolerated by all um, infants is rice cereal. And it's just one teaspoon, that's all they need. And you're gonna see them, you put it on their mouth, like, uh, uh, you're gonna stick it out. They're gonna have to learn how to understand that thicker food and how to put it in. And it's just repetition, repetition. And then what do we add? It doesn't matter. Uh, physicians all have different schedules they like. It's just a personal thing with them. But as nurses, we teach our parents every four to seven days, you must keep a child on one type of new addition. And then after that seven days, you can add a new food. So it's waiting for time in between. And why do we wait? Well, all children are not, they can't tolerate all foods. And some foods can be an allergic reaction. Now, allergic reactions could be a little rash. It could be a diaper rash. It could be spit up. I could see abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation. So if there's a change in that infant, it could be related to the food. And usually what the physician will say is, take them off, try something else, and go back and try it again. If it does it again, avoid it, keep away from it. And then later on in life, try again. Dental health, they should be um, having teeth come in, they say it's six months. Well, not every kid gets a tooth at six months. As I, I always will tell you, you're gonna hear about my grandson because it's the latest kid in my life, he's six now. He didn't get any teeth till he was 15 months and he got six. I and mean, that's normal, you know? So you could see them there, but they weren't coming up. But they say that the formula is the age of the child in months minus six should be the number of teeth. So if they're 12 months old, they should have six teeth. As I said, they're not all the same. Now, the one mistake I made with my oldest son, because we didn't have sippy cups to 39 years ago, is he used to carry his bottle around of apple juice with his teeth with on the nipple like this, right? Guess what he got? Bottle mouth. He got that black teeth stuff going on, me as a nurse, okay? Go figure. But we didn't have any improvement. That's why all of these improvements have been made so that children today are better than they were and children tomorrow will be even better than today. That's the progress of some medicine and medical care that you're gonna see. So brush the teeth, water, um, no toothpaste at first. A lot of water does have fluoride in it, so be careful with that. Um, again, no propping the, the bottles and we've all done it if you have children and there should be no milk or juice in bed. Um, if the kid has to, you know, water, water would be your choice. And pacifier is absolutely optimal. You know, there has been, since I have, you know, learned about children, there's been back and forth on using pacifiers. But today we've got some clinical evidence, research, evidence-based proof that shows that pacifiers um, do help a child through stressful times, you know, because they, 
spore the world in their mouth and they decrease their stress in their mouth. It's the mouth is their whole world. They're exploring and giving them that pacifier does help them with that sucking need that they want to suck. Sleeping, we know infants should be sleeping a lot, but of course they're awake half the night because you want to sleep. Um, that's just part of what infants do for the first couple of weeks. And then hopefully they'll turn around and then all of a sudden they'll be sleeping nine to 11 hours. The one thing I tell new mothers, if your baby is normal, healthy, gaining weight every visit, if they want to sleep eight hours, let them sleep. Because if you wake them up, they are going to wake up all the time. And you're never going to get this child to sleep throughout the night because they're going to want that snack in the middle of the night. Makes sense, right? I have my um, daughter's fiance sister has a woman full baby and she's Hispanic. So they're a little bit overly. My daughter is half Hispanic too. So um, I, I, I'm aware. And she's like, my baby slept eight hours. I woke up, but I was so worried. And should I have done that? And is anything going to happen? No, you're going to sleep. You're going to feel better. And you're teaching the child to sleep all night long. Now, if they're premature, they're underweight, those are different circumstances. But normal babies should sleep. And this is a breastfed baby who usually should be waking up more often. So usually breastfed babies every two to three hours are awake. Hopefully we'll get them longer. They nap one, two, three times a day, normal. They get a little bit of tummy time, hopefully, so they can straighten their heads out. And they say walker swings and play pens are not necessary at this time. We all use them because they're cute. I think those little swings, it's great. You put them in and you go do your chores and they're swinging and they fall asleep. They say it's good for colic. I mean, but the book says no. Now I talked about all those immunizations, right? Well, hep B is the one we give at the hospital before they're discharged. So hepatitis B is given before they go home, usually. The only time when it's not, and you go to that one week after you come home from the hospital visit, they'll give it, is insurance. Something to do with insurance and payments. I don't know. It's uh, the veins in my existence, you know, worrying about authorizations for stuff, right? But all of these other things there are in your book. Um, about when to give them. And we're going to go into particulars about those as we continue. Now, a kid with colic, one of the hardest children to take care of, because usually colic lasts for about five months, which means you're not going to be sleeping that well. What does colic do? Well, it's gas. It's in the abdomen. It causes pain. The kids are uncomfortable. So what can we do to teach parents to help decrease how much colic these children have? Well, number one, we have to, if we're breastfeeding, we cannot be changing foods we're eating. We need to eat very mild foods, stuff that's not gassy, like eating like cucumbers or things that give you gas. Don't do it because it will be passed to your child. So eat easy. That's first thing. Number two, do not overfeed your child, okay? And make sure that they are well burped. Now, a lot of breastfed babies, they're hard to burp. So teaching them, as we learn ourselves, how to burp babies, um, teaching them how to burp them well. I do the rock and roll is what I call it. Put my hand underneath their chin. I have them sitting on my knee and I'm rocking them back and forth and forward and backwards and picking them up a little bit and all of a sudden they'll burp. But I mean, you're talking many years of experience in burping infants. The other thing is keep them sitting up in a little uh, seat for at least a half hour after they eat. And all of those things should help. If not, they'll put your child on some sort of semethicone, mylocon, little gases, one of those. And then if that doesn't work and we're seeing some reflux, a little spit up, something going on too, they might put them on an antacid uh, like famididine. It used to be bradididine, Zantac, but we don't give that anymore. It is the pepsid side that we give now. Now, failure to thrive is growth failure. Well, how would we know that they have failure to thrive? Well, they're not gaining weight, right? That's why, again, we weigh our children all the time. So if they're not gaining weight, there needs to be a reason why. 
Sometimes it could be a metabolic and intolerance. It could be intolerance metabolically, or these children don't tolerate milk. There's all things, they're spitting up, spitting up, diarrhea. I mean, all of these things, you're losing calories, losing something that should be kept in there, right? So they're gonna do a big workup, trying to determine what we need to do. I mean, it could be that we need to increase calories in formula. Um, or even breast milk. We have breast milk fortifier, which puts extra calories in it. So there's all things that we can do to give extra calories to catch them up because failure to thrive means they're not getting nutrition, which means they could be developmentally left behind if we don't do something to get their nutrition there. Now, some of the things we see with children is those flat heads. We used to call them toaster heads. Uh, because they're only laid on their sides sometimes. Um, and, you know, today with back to sleep, we've got children with flat heads in the back, right? So how do we take care of that? Well, the baby's scalps are very soft still. They're still malleable. They're not hard and brittle like our bones are. And just putting them on tummy time, you know, one or two times a day will help it round out. If we're seeing that it's not getting better, you can get these helmets like this bottom right hand picture. And that's just basically to round out the head. And they put that on during the day, sometimes all day. It depends, whatever, you know, the um, neurologist says to do with it. And then diaper dermatitis. You know, diaper dermatitis could be an allergic reaction to food, could be an allergic reaction to the diaper, to the wipes to the lotion, to the cream, to the shampoo, the body bath, could be allergic to anything. So um, how do we treat it? Well, number one, try to keep it as clean and dry as possible. That's the number one reason why infants don't sleep all night long, because during the night they pee or they poop in their diaper and it burns and it wakes them up. So making sure that we put that linoleum, that some sort of emollient cream on there. I mean, I used to love A&D ointment on my kids and, or just Vaseline, it protects them. So the acid can't get to it and it can allow that child to sleep. Many times it could be due to yeast. You know, it's a hot, moist place and yeast loves to grow there. So there would be some medicine that we would have to put there, nice statin. I mean, that could be for that yeast in the mouth, right? Or, which is thrush, or it could be from a diaper rash. There's powders, there's creams, and there's- What about cornstarch? My mom always said that, cornstarch. Yeah, it, it keeps it dry. It, there's nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it at all. But you're drying it out, but you're not protecting that red area. So then it would be putting on something to keep the moisture from going in. Like desitin is a cream. It'll water soluble, it'll go through. But the A and D ointment is an ointment. It protects it, the emollient, okay? It's actually the best way to do that. In fact, I'm fighting with my daughter's fiance's um, sister right now. The baby just had an alt to you moment and just had a diaper rash and feeding and <laughs> all of these things I'm talking about. I just told her all of these things. Um, which is, she said, that's exactly what the doctor told me. I said, yes, okay. Cradle cap. Cradle cap is, you know, you have this beautiful little baby girl and you want to put these big little ribbons in their hair and they've got the flaky head and it's like, oh, you want to get it taken care of quickly and get rid of that flake. How do you do it? Well, just a soft comb, a soft brush, wash it normally. Um, they also say put a little mineral oil there on, at night. And in the morning, wake up and then just do the shampoo with a soft brush. And it's not going to go away in one day, but you're going to get it away, you know, quicker than not doing anything at all. <clears throat> now, sudden infant death syndrome, this is why they're back to sleep now. We place them on their backs um, because they found out that children, um, through research, a lot of research, that children placed on their back to sleep have far less incidence of SIDS death. Now, what are the risks? Well, there's something to do with the ethnicity of it, of the patient, the child, but males are more than females. So boys, now usually it's about ages two to four months. 
A secondhand smoke is a big thing. So anybody who smokes in the house, get outside. Because that smoke, even if they're in their room, they still can get it and it could happen. Having them too hot, overdressed. I think a lot of people think that babies are cold and then you need to like overdress them. And they say, if you're comfortable, put one more like t-shirt on the baby, you know, to go to sleep at night. And today we don't use blankets because they can smother in them. So they should be in one of those sleepy type gowns and maybe just an underneath onesie with it. So though, that's the way that you would do it and not overheat them. If they've had a cold, stuffy nose, that can increase the chances. Breastfeeding decreases chances of SIDS death. So it's one of those things that we can say to promote that breastfeeding. Poor socioeconomic conditions, it's too hot, it's too cold, you know, the environment, immunizations. Um, and again, air pollution has to do with like secondhand smoke. And remember, should be a firm mattress, nothing in there. I mean, when my babies were born, I had these beautiful bumper pads and they were so cute, but you know something? They hang themselves on it. They can really tangle up in them. So that's why no more. And they're taking the slats and the cribs and making them closer. So they can't get their heads out. Kids were literally with their heads hanging out, hold on, and then their bodies were there and they were hanged in their cribs. Oh yeah. So a lot of changes have been done to protect our infants. So what do you think about this? Leticia is a breastfed infant being seen in the clinic for her six month checkup. Her mother tells the nurse that Leticia recently began to suck her thumb. Which of the following is the best nursing intervention? Well, number one, it's six months old. Are they into sucking things? How do they explore the world, right? How do they self-soothe themselves? with their mouth, so normal, absolutely normal. They may want the pacifier. They may want, my daughter was this finger, this way. Some kids are this way. Remember though, if you're putting an IV in, don't take their hand or their finger away because they still need to self-soothe. All right, we're gonna go into these theorists as we go along here, okay? So infants, Erickson, what does that mean? Well, Erickson says that when a child's needs are met, they're happy. They're satisfied and they're great babies. And what does that mean? It means when they cry, because they want mommy, because they're hungry, they're wet, they need to be burped, or just want mommy, somebody comes and picks them up. They're happy. So they know when they need somebody, that person is there. Mistrust is when they cry, 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 and cry and nobody comes in and they're left there for a long time. So they're hungry, they are wet and they're not happy. So these children mistrust. So trust is when needs are met, mistrust is when nobody takes care of them or really delayed. Now Piaget talks, remember, it's more about cognitive and thinking and putting stuff together, okay? so. Remember, the world is explored through their mouth and by the senses of things and moving things around and realizing I can move that rattle around, right? So let's look at birth, that first thing. What's the first thing they do? Well, they might all of a sudden slip their thumb in their mouth by accident. And all of a sudden they suck on it and they go, oh, I like this. Well, my pacifier is not around. Look, I got a finger and they continue to do it. That is learning, right? They didn't know that at birth. Nobody taught them that. So that's a sensory motor. And then we're gonna go off into some other ones as we go. Another thing is as they get older and older, let's say four to eight months. Well, now you've grasped that rattle, it's in your hand. And what happens if all of a sudden you move your hand and that rattle makes a noise? They go, oh, look at that, it made a noise. And they would take the rattle and now they'll make the noise because you, they were in their hand by accident. It made a noise, but now they're going to do it voluntarily. Makes sense, right? Very simple things. And this is how we learn. Now, body image. Well, when they're born, they don't know themselves. But as they start getting more mobile and sitting, 
you know, they're going to be finding them. Usually there's a mirror around or there's on their um, little play things that we have with mirrors and they're going to be starting looking at themselves and they're start going to get interested in that. Remember the object permanence is the infant, even, you know, as they get older, if you have a toy, you show it to them, they know it's there, even if they cannot see it. Like if you put the rattle, and this is what we do on tummy time, show them the rattle, put it behind something, and they're going to try to use their muscles to go get it because object permanence. They know it's there. They just got to work for it to get it. And that's one of the ways we get them, you know, using their motor and their muscles, et cetera. Attachment, you know that uh, infants, many of them only will go to mom or dad and they don't want to go to any other people or they'll turn around and say, I want you. Separation anxiety is when um, there's a couple stages of separation anxiety. The book goes into it really well. And it talks about how, let's say you have a child has to go into the hospital and mom has to go home because there's another child or they have to go to work or whatever reason. And the child's left alone. So that person they know is not there. And initially, what do they do? They cry, 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 right? And then what happens? They stop crying. And then sometimes because they have to be gone for work and then they, there's other children they have to work with and they only can come in at certain times, which is reality. I mean, that's, parents still have a life besides a child in the hospital. It happens. And all of a sudden the, the mother comes back and the kid really doesn't want to bother with them because they're, I don't know if it's that they're upset with them or they're like, well, I've learned how to, you know, take care of myself. So I'm just going to sit here and play with my toys. And then the parents are like, but they don't want me. So why should I stay? And I'm like, well, it's because they're going through this, these feelings and this is normal. Stranger fear, we know um, they're afraid of strangers, especially with those white coats on, right? Or those uniforms. They get, you know, scared of those things as they get older because all we do is poke them and pick on them and stick them with things, right? And they get worried about it. And remember, we need to play and have fun with them. Start doing the peekaboo. And you're going to be about nine months old where you could do that peekaboo when they're looking around with their heads not facing you. And you go look at them, go peekaboo. And now all of a sudden, guess what? They're going to go to you because now you're not threatening. Their language, it starts with cooing and crying, right? And again, play is how these children learn, whether it's through a rattle, whether it's trying to go find a toy that's hidden, all of those things. Um, and it's going to continue to play as we go through life. We're always playing with something. And then your temperament. You know, kids are all different. You've got the kids that nothing bothers them. Then you've got children who doesn't like change of environment, et cetera. There's a way that we can measure that. And there is a questionnaire for that. Now let's go into our toddlers. You know, I think it's one of my favorite age of children. This is ages one to three, 12 months to 36 months. These kids are like a blender with the lid off, which means they're everywhere all at once. You cannot keep up with these children. They're crawling, they're walking, they're underneath, around, over and under stuff. And you just got to try to keep them safe, right? They're also into those temper tantrums. What do you do if a child has a temper tantrum? Nothing. Leave them there. Unless they can hurt themselves. I mean, many of these young kids, it's in the grocery store. And they just flail on the floor, right? And they're screaming, they're yelling and crying. And walk away as long as they are not in danger and they can't hurt themselves. Now, what does that do to the child? You haven't recognized their temper tantrum. They're getting no recognition, so they're not gonna do it again. So if they're having a temper tantrum, you pick them up, guess what? They're gonna do it again. So that's what's recommended there. Also, these kids are egocentric, concentristic, which means me, 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 my ego, me, all about mine, me. And the, even toys, they'll rip it out of kids' hands because it's all about me, me, mine, mine. <laughs> Again, their birth weight, about two and a half years old, should quadruple. Their height, 
um, and weight, again, it slows way down now. They're going to see their legs get bigger and they're gonna get heavier. They're gonna grow tall and then get heavier and grow tall and get heavier. It's like the stair step sort of thing. Their head, which was really big at birth by about one and a half years old, should be equal to their chest at this point, if not smaller than their chest. Again, if it's bigger, then there's a problem. So we need to investigate. Something's going on. Their body system, you know, toddlers is the point where we start potty training, right? Um, these children, um, we know if they can hold their stool. So um, bowel training is easier than bladder training, okay? They're going to have <clears throat> a lot of upper respiratory infections. You know, they're wide open, short canals, a little bit of mucus, and they're getting a lot of upper respiratory, right? They go right up into the ear. So ear infections are common. You know, most of these kids have to be in some sort of daycare. And very rarely do you have somebody who watches them. So they're with a group of kids. What do a bunch of toddlers do when they're playing toys? They swap them around, right? So they're swapping their spit. This is my mucus to this kid's mucus to the other ones. And it's part of sharing their germs. Now, as a double-edged sword because it actually helps their immune system. They are being exposed and they're going to build up those antibodies. So by the time they get to school, they're not gonna be as sick as much. I mean, although I know some parents say, you know, I put my kid in daycare and every week I'm going to the doctor now because they're sick. And that is part of it. Gross fine motor development, it starts to get better coordination between two to three. And by 12 to 15 months, you have from one hand to another hand. Both of them are working. It's like, is it going to be right-handed or left-handed? Well, you don't know yet. You're using both. And they should be throwing a ball by about 18 months old. Their vision now is working really good. Their depth perception is good, a lot better. They're getting more coordinated. They're not wobbly and falling down like the younger kids. Um, their hearing, smell, taste, touch is all becoming uh, a lot more fine-tuned. And the one thing that happens is they get very picky in their eating because they taste it more. You know, ever taste baby food like the cereal or some of those formulas? Ugh, they're nasty, but these kids don't have that taste, so they don't understand it yet. As they get to be toddlers, they do. <coughs> now... <clears throat> Sometimes it has to do with texture. They don't want new things, whether it's soft, smooth, chunky, coarse. Some of them don't like certain textures. So that could be the thing. Now, it is said that toddlers go through what we call a physiologic anorexia, which means they barely, barely eat. But these children should be eating about one tablespoon of food per sitting per age in years. So two tablespoons of food per sitting is just a little bit, right? And we all think they need more, they need more, they need more. Well, as long again as they're gaining weight, they're okay, right? And this is actually a time where they explore their food. You know, it's going to be all over their high chairs, all over them, all over the floor. It's just part of that exploring, you know, how things feel and touch and how you can throw them around. And I mean, it's not the nicest thing to clean up, but it is part of growth. So Erickson, when we talk about your toddler, it's a sense of autonomy, autonomy. I want to do it, me, 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 right? But the problem, and that's okay. They need to learn how to do things. They need to learn how to play by themselves or maybe start following little tiny directions. But what happens is what we call shame and doubt and what that is. Now, this is something I had to learn with my grandson. I had to let him try to do things even if he was gonna fail. And I had to stop trying to overprotect him because he needed to fall or he needed not to be able to do something to learn. Example. My grandson wanted to jump from 
one couch to the other couch. And it was pretty far away. And I'm like, no, 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 be careful. Don't do that. You're going to hurt yourself. Well, my husband just took a big pillow and put it in between it. He said, go ahead, jump. And of course, he didn't make it, but he fell and he didn't hurt himself. What did he learn? Well, he learned that he could jump, but that was too far away. So next time he wouldn't do that. Me, if I didn't let him do it, guess what? He'd try again. It's like trying to learn how to ride a tricycle. You know, put him in the proper safety gear, right? But if he's like going in the wrong place, you know, maybe into a puddle or into dirt, let him do it. Don't say, no, 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 watch out. Don't do this, don't do that. That makes them, I don't know if I can or can't. That is shame and doubt. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, one thing that Erickson also says is ritualism. Now, children ages one to three need to be on a schedule. Same things, that same rituals. They wake up, they have breakfast, they change their clothes, they play, they take a nap, they wake up, they eat lunch. I mean, the same things all the time. And in a hospital, we try to put them on that same schedule as much as possible even same foods as we can, if it's allowed on their diets, right? If you take a toddler on vacation, they're, they're really hard to take because they get off their schedules and they're frustrated and you don't want that. Um, but you need to go on vacation anyway, so you're gonna do it. But the reason why they're so frustrated is they like their schedule a certain way. But if you go to the beach, you can't be like every you know, two hours going in, letting them have a nap and this and that, you're gonna try to do different things, which is okay, but that's why they get frustrated. Now, cognitive development with Piaget. Well, this is all about active experimentation. This is where they're gonna take a broom and they're gonna ride on it like it's a horsey. This is when mommy goes into the kitchen and they take their sippy cup, throw it on the floor, because they know mommy's going to come back because they want mommy back. They've learned how to control you through this because of cognitive, being smart, figuring things out. That's what they're doing, okay? And they will do things when they want things or they'll do things because it seems like fun, like riding that broom because it's a horsey or taking a piece of paper and flying it around like it's an airplane. This is all Piaget. Again, those are all the things that I have just said. These are the pictures that show what I just said about sucking the finger, rattling, throwing things on the floor. It's part of it. As we get older in school age, we're going to learn more about concrete, uh, but we're not there yet this week. Just to show you it, that thinking becomes more and more and more. Now, one of the things about their gender, their gender and sexuality is remember, this is the age where we're potty training. And when you're potty training, they're going to see differences in mommy and daddy. And why do you stand up and I sit down, you know, or vice versa. And they're going to start questioning things. This is when you should give, you know, those private parts a name. Now, with my grandson, it was a penis and a vagina. I gave him the right names. So he's not uh, shy to say that name. He says, but I have a penis, but you have a vagina, Nana. And I'm like, yeah, I do. Okay. I have to sit down, but you can stand up. I mean, I'd rather stand up, but I can't. So it's not a big deal. Now, they're going to start touching down there because it feels good, right? They're going to touch. The thing that we should do and teach parents is to say, you want to touch yourself, go in your room or go in the bathroom. I don't need to be watching you. And we, me and my husband are always like, go wash your hands. Let's have something to eat. You've been touching yourself, you know, just to let them know that um, these different things. But, you know, very, he has what he has and it's fine. They are also going to go, mommy has the boys and the boy, the girls go to daddy. It's just part of, they like the opposite sex. And they're going to be starting to dress up with them and all of those sort of things. Their language is going to get more. Now, by the end of first year, they should be saying at least a one word sentence. Mama, daddy, more, milk, whatever, you know, 
or and like a lot of them will do the sign languages like my grandson knew this which means more i want more you know different things to have them express and be able to tell me what they do want now as they get older they're going to understand most of what you're saying but they can't speak it they can't say it yet so it's going to be a little frustrating for them and for you especially if it's somebody else than a family member trying to figure out what they're saying because of the way they pronounce things, et cetera, et cetera. But remember, they understand more than you think. Just because they can't say it doesn't mean they don't um, understand it. They're going to become more and more independent. Remember, me, me, mine, mine, egocentric, egocentric. They want to do things for themselves and you should let them feeding themselves, and I'm telling you, it's going to be a mess, but that's part of exploration, part of cognitive development. Let them go. And then playing, you know, playing with toys, dolls, or whether they're playing with cars, whatever they are, they're flying in the air, they're talking to each other, they're becoming creative. You know, it's uh, quite fun to watch these little kids play. They're going to be dressing and undressing. Now, they may not dress themselves, you know, with the pants the right way or the shirt the right way. It could be inside out. It doesn't matter. The point is that is that they're trying. And that should be, you know, said, wow, you put your shirt on. Oh, it's backwards. Let me just help you. And then teach them where the tag is. So next time, maybe they can do it better, but let them know how great they're doing. And they're starting to understand other people and when other people hurt. Ever have a little toddler come up to you when you have a boo-boo and they kiss it and all better? I mean, it's the sweetest thing you can ever see. Again, play, 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 play. This starts at interaction and sharing with each other. It doesn't mean they're gonna share. It doesn't mean not to go up to another kid and rip the toy out of their hand and play with it because they wanted it, but it's part of that development of um, being um, with other social and with other children. Toddlers have play, they play mostly parallel play, which means I'm playing here, she's playing there, not the same toys, not together, but next to each other. That's parallel play. They don't know how to share yet. They don't know how to play and do cooperative play yet, okay? They're what they imitate. They see something going on, they're gonna imitate it, and they love everything with texture, like sense pleasure, sand, right, in the hands. Oh, they love stuff like that, or mud. Toilet training, you know, when does it happen? They're all different. I, I can't tell you a specific time. They're all different. <laughs> we know that um, if you have more than one child, you're gonna see I'm, you love him more than you love me. I mean, I can't even tell you how many times I heard this of my daughter and my son. And it was always my daughter telling me, you love him more than you love me. And I'm like, no, I love you both the same. It's different. You're both awesome. But it's just part of what they do. So they're going to be hurting each other, hitting each other and yelling and, you know, and then you separate them and time out and all that great stuff, right? Again, those temper tantrums that I said, remember timeouts is one minute per year of age if we need to, and making sure that they know what they did wrong and that the timeout will start when they stop crying and when they're quiet and sit there. Again, the negativism, the no, 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 me do, mine, 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 right? And what if all of a sudden you have a child who was born um, a new infant? You might see them regress. Gina, did you have a question? Yes, it says um, must have three signs of readiness. What are the three signs? The, one of the signs would be is they're starting to say that they have to go or they start to run, taking their diapers off. Bladder training starts when there's two hours of a dry diaper type thing, okay? It's, you know, it's, the, the kid will actually tell you. He, he, they sort of know about it. And now regression, <clears throat> you know, regression happens when there's stress in their life. It could be that they had to move or it could be that um, they can't find the dog or the cat's missing or grandma died or all of these things create stress. 
and these kids will go backwards. And it might be they go back to sucking their finger. It might be they go back if they're potty trained, they're going to be having accidents. This is where you see that regression. It might mean that they need that special blanket or that special toy because it's that comfort thing or they want that pacifier again. It's all part of it. And you know that picture of that boy pointing backwards on the toilet helped me with my grandson. Because think about a boy sitting the opposite way. His penis goes up and where's the urine go? On the floor in front of him, right? But if you turn him backwards, it does point downwards. And it eliminated a lot of mess in my house. So I'm just letting you know. So we know that refinement of coordination begins. Throwing the ball. When does it begin? About 18 months, fine motor improvement uh, dexterity, between two to three, and refinement is 12 to 15 months. So those are those things. So social um, milestones, we know that those children are going to start speaking multi-words. They're going to be taking care of themselves, like I've said already. And then car seats. Do you know that little metal car seat? I remember one. I remember one. And you know where me and my younger brother sat? We sat in the front seat next to mom and dad. And the five brothers that I had were in the back. There were seven of us. So how has car seats changed over the years? Let me tell you, a lot. So what do you need to know about car seats? Well, number one, they need to be of age. They can't be expired. It should be rear facing till two years old. And they can turn around at two years old. Now I was in a quandary with my grandson, because he only weighed 24 pounds at two years old. He was a peanut, still a peanut. But because his motor development was caught up at two, he could be turned front ways. Because it's either two years or 30 pounds, you've heard. So no, he was able to be turned around. And then make sure that those straps, that harness fits nice and snugly to hold him in there. And there's a whole bunch of good stuff here. You know, I wouldn't be taking a car seat if I had a daughter, you know, six, eight years ago and put them in that car seat, um, that would be dangerous because probably that car seat's expired. Maybe from your friend who she has a daughter who's a year old. Well, that one year old is going to be OK, that car seat. But be very careful. Car seats are important and they save lives. And now the preschoolers. You know, the books is three to five, but, you know, school age starts at age six. So it's like three to six years old. OK just to let you know. So what happens? At three years old, now the kid's more alert. The kid's talking more. The kid is um, able to express themselves. They're more, have more manual dexterity. So now we're getting them ready to go to school. And the one thing about sending them to school is by this age, we should be reading them books at night to get them ready for that. We need to give them that positive attitude. We need to have them around other kids so that they're socially adept to, to be able to fit in to multi-children in a classroom and one teacher or teacher and an aide, right? Very, very important. Because what happens also is now you put them in school, they have to sit down and their attention span has to keep going, right? They have to be able to pay attention and follow directions and be away from mom and dad for that long. Again, their height and weight is slowing down, but they're still gaining weight. They're still gaining some height, you know, and they're becoming more and more mature. These children do not have to be as ritual as your toddlers. They can deal with that stress easier. So you can do a lot of changes with these and it doesn't affect them like it does toddlers. So gross motor, get up, go, go, go. What are they doing? Walking, running, climbing, jumping. Fine motor, we're talking about crayons and coloring, buttoning a shirt, fine fingers, right? Buttoning the shirt, those are things we do. Erickson, Erickson is basically talking about they have feelings of guilt, anxiety, and fear because they think that their thoughts are different. That means kids don't like me because they don't understand me. They don't know. They're also starting to think about things before they do things. Now, Kohlberg is all about morality, but 
psychosocial development, cognitive development, we know it does have something to do with right and wrong. An understanding that they want good things right should be done and they have a conscience. I did something wrong. I mean, finding crayon coloring on my porch, on a newly painted porch and my grandson, I said, what did you do? He said, I was gonna tell you, Nana, I colored on it. I shouldn't have done it. Yes, at least you know it, but it's still colored on, right? Again, as I said, we're getting them ready, getting ready for school. Now, Piaget. Piaget is all about language, expressing themselves. It's getting away from all about me, worrying about other children, what other people think. They're starting to understand other cultures, other people, what they look like, feel like. Um, and they're also understanding what that consequence means. If they've done good things that, you know, they'll get those praise and those bad things, there might be something taken away. They don't understand time. So how do they understand time? Well, earlier in the preschool ages, my grandson would say, I can stay here for two morning times, which means he will sleep overnight two times and wake up in the morning. That's how he knows it. What so it is, time is with events. After lunch, we're gonna go to the grocery store. After you take your nap, we're gonna go swimming. After whatever, that's when we're gonna do that. When the sun comes up in the morning, we're leaving to Disney. Whatever it is, it's a time with an event and that's the way they get it. And then these are the kids that really get into that magical thinking. They're playing, they're talking. They might even be talking to somebody else. You know, their imaginary friend, absolutely normal at this age, you know, and they're being creative and it really makes their mind grow and expand. Now, Kohlberg, as I said, it's similar in some ways to cognition, it's the way you think, but Kohlberg is only about moral development. Now, preschoolers, understand right and wrong and that there's a consequence for each as in I do something right something good's going to happen to me if I do something bad I'm going to have something a punishment a timeout something taken away they know that and they know that they've done something wrong that they should be punished for it through sexuality as I said you have moms with fathers and boys with mothers. It's just part of it. They start getting dressed up. They're starting with, um, again, finding their genitals and playing with them, even masturbating at this age. <clears throat> A question that my grandson gave his father the other day. How did you get me? How did you put me inside mommy's belly? <laughs> and he came to me and said, what am I supposed to tell this kid? I said, so how do you think that happens? And then you understand what they think. And then it doesn't come into this big conversation that does not need to be said, right? Always find out what do they know first. So preschoolers, again, that ritualism is gone. That negativism is going away. They can dress themselves and do actually a pretty good job now. They love to please. They love for mommy and daddy say, great job, right? They understand the family, the culture, the values, and they try to live up to that. Play. Now there's a couple types of plays, very important. You're gonna see these over and over again. Associative play is kids playing together with the same toys, but there's no rules. So they might be playing with trucks and cars together and maybe, you know, you know, uh, each other chasing each other with cars, but there's not somebody who wins. Like a board game would be more of a cooperative play where there's a winner. Associative play, there isn't. They sometimes will imitate. Again, they have those imaginary playmates. We do dramatic play sometimes in hospitals where we want to find out things that have gone on with children, like mostly with sexual abuse or abuse type things. And we give them boys, girls, uh, dolls, 
you know, to see what they do with them, where they touch each other and watch them play to see if there's any signs of it. Because they don't know if they've done right or wrong. They don't know if somebody's done, done something right or wrong. They don't understand that yet. So they have to show it to you. And of course, they're going to play together. They hate the dark. They hate being left alone. You know, sending the kid to bed, it's like, turn all the lights on and go. Or it's dark time. He wants to go get something. Lights on, lights on, lights on everywhere. They don't like large dogs. They're afraid of them. They're afraid of ghosts. Um, they're also afraid that something's going to happen to their penis. Something's going to happen there. And again, like I said earlier, objects are people associated with pain. So nurses, they are, and physicians, they know that most likely, because every time they go to the doctor, usually it's immunizations, right? So they're afraid of that. So sexual education, as I said, find out what they know or think before you give information. They say to use correct anatomical words and to be honest. And as I said, masturbation is common. Starts about four years old and make sure that it's a private act. Send them to their room, you know, put them somewhere else. They don't need to be in front of you doing whatever they're doing, all right? And fears, like I just said. So let's go to cahoots. So how did you all do there? Any questions? So Gina, could you put your last name on your Zoom? Do you know how, Gina? Put in the chat box. Oh, I, thought, I thought you said Gina. I'm no, China. Gina. Oh, China. I'm sorry. Sorry, Professor. I just got into the Zoom because I was attending to the wrong section with another professor. Okay. Okay. Just send me a message I, regarding please. that, okay? Put the message. I, Send me a message in Canvas so that I can document you for that, okay? Okay. Already there, Betty. Oh, hi there, Darlene. <laughs> hi, boss. How you doing? Following Daniela around. <laughs> <laughs> How wonderful. Nice to have your hand held. Okay, good. Now everybody has their name up correctly. As I told you in the beginning, having your correct name there is so important because it has to do with attendance. And I want to make sure that you get proper attendance because I can't remember all the names and, and I don't want to, you know, fault you because their name isn't there. Okay. So let's go to cahoots. Who's going to win today? Justin's going to win. I know he is. What do you think, Justin? Yeah. Maybe. Who knows? We'll see. Oh, I'm pretty sure you could. So anybody have any questions so far about what's going on? A lot, a lot, a lot of information. Remember, when you talk about infants going into preschool or that age is one to six, so much. I love all of these comical characters. So tell me, can you pick which character you want? You can, but it randomly does it for you too. Oh, okay. I just think it's pretty neat. All right, that looks like about everybody, let's go. There's 59 questions here. Again, remember, stop me if you don't understand. So week two, infant, toddlers, and a preschooler. Or more. A multi select types of pleasure play considered to be sense pleasure play. Remember, as I said, play is the most important things with children. They learn from it, they experiment with it, they, you know, put two and two together, they make things work. It's their magical time in life. I mean, I want to go sit on a beach and make a sandcastle, right? Now remember, sense pleasure is everything that they touch, what they feel, they love. Is it hard? Is it soft? Does it run through my fingers? Does it smush like in mud, right? But sand, finger painting, as I told you, they love to play with food, right? That's part of that sense pleasure. And again, that is learning and development of their cognitive, you know, mind. 
The nurse notices with patches, white patches in the mouth of the infant that cannot be removed with a tongue blade. What do you think you need to do for that? You do an assessment, you look at the tongue, it's got this thick white stuff on it. And take a tongue blade, you try to get it off and it don't come. I mentioned that when I was talking about the diaper rash. And it's like a yeast, right? And remember, yeast does need medicine. As much as you wipe it, it's not going to go away and it will need some medicine. And they have this, what you call the swish and swallow if you are older, or they have, um, you put a little bit on each side or you take a little gauze um, and you put it and you wipe it around the mouth and it does go away. It's also in the Spanish world called ungo, if those of you don't know what that is too. What type of play is considered cooperative play? We have parallel play, we have associative play, we have cooperative play. There's all sorts of play we do and they all have a certain function for the mind to develop. Now, cooperative play is more about two or more children playing together using the same toys and that there is an end, somebody wins. You think of a board game, right? Checkers, or when you take that game, sorry, and you push the thing and you move the things around, whoever gets them all in, they win. Whatever game has an ending where there's a winner, that is called cooperative play. And these are more the preschoolers, your older preschoolers that can do those things. According to Kohlberg, pre-conventional level of moral development, a preschooler who has moral reasoning. Now, what did I tell you about Kohlberg? He's all about morality, right? What does that morality mean? And those preschoolers really understand this. They know good and bad is a consequence for each. So if they do good, it, good things happen, whether it's going to be just a praise or maybe it's going to be a piece of candy. Who knows whatever the mother's into. Or if they do something wrong, they might have time out or get a toy taken away. As we get older and to the school age, it's going to be pleasing somebody. They want to please. They want to do good because they want to please. But at this age, they don't want to please yet. They know right and wrong. They don't know to do it all the time to be good. Which nursing action is appropriate to teach a preschool age child about a scheduled procedure? So preschooler ages three to five, almost six, they need to go in and have their tubes put in their ears. They have to go to surgery. Well, First of all, you need to get on their level. Developmentally, get on their level. Don't be towering over, even you know physically. You don't want to be there. Get down lower. Break the ice open. Talk to that child about, wow, what a cool shirt. What, oh, your curly hair. Wow, big eyes. Or what do you like with school? Something, break the ice. Then take the doll or equipment. Let them touch it, feel it, and explain what's going to happen. A child who has been taught what's going to go on will tolerate that procedure so much better. And, you know, sometimes it takes 10, 15 minutes to do that. It saves you an hour and a lot of struggle in some of these children. And they do, even three-year-olds, understand these things. In fact, they want to know. A multi. What are some findings from a pediatric physical assessment? So read the question, what's physical? We have histories and we have physicals that we do on every child when they're admitted to a hospital. You know, many times as we're reading questions and in exams, it's, it's trying to figure out what the question's asking for. So make sure you're listening to the question and what is it asking? So physicals, things you can touch and hear and see. So growth, as I said, height and weight, they're always done, right? And then body systems, how are their lungs, how are their tummy, and of course, any vital signs, including temperature. 
that medical history is that a uh, history. We're not doing that yet. We just wanted a physical look at that child. Before performing a physical assessment on a toddler, the nurse should do what? To encourage cooperation. Remember toddlers, they're ages one to three. They love that routine. They like the same familiarity and you're something different. So first thing you do is nothing, right? Go in there, get on their level, get on their developmental level by asking questions or using play to ask them where's their ears, their nose, these children. Then you can do that, let them do play, let them touch the equipment. But you're not gonna go in there and touch them right away. They're gonna scream, go in the opposite direction. And you're not gonna get an assessment done, right? How do you do an assessment on a child? Is it head to toe? What would you do first? Kids sit in mother's lap. What would you do first? At the respiration. There you go. You might do something like that. Very good. Or just look how they're breathing. Very good. <clears throat> what would you suspect if you note that an infant's chin is quivering, their fists are clenched, and they're inconsolable? This is almost like that black scale, right? We talk about uh, faces, legs, activity, consolability, and crying, right? <clears throat> it's all about pain. You know, they're telling you something's hurting. Now, what if they're like shaking their head or hitting their head? You're probably telling you where the location of that pain is. Because if it's an infant, they can't say, oh, my ear hurts, right? They're just showing you they hurt somewhere. But by the way they're acting, they can tell you, oh, it's probably that ear going on. A multi-select. Erickson describes infants as trust versus mistrust. What does trust mean? Again, an infant who trusts is happy, they're calmer, they're secure because they know I cry, somebody's coming to get me. My needs are met. Mistrust, they don't. And you know, those infants, you know, because they'll be sitting there crying. Um, they won't actually, they won't be crying when they're not getting things done because they're used to it. And you could tell that trust versus mistrust. When a kid gets to the hospital, if mom's not around, you can tell. A three-year-old's having an outpatient procedure. How would you help the child be less fearful? <clears throat> I'm hitting this point quite well here. You know, I used to get along with the kids really well. I always had stickers in my pocket and I would always sit down next to them. And I'd start the conversation, talk about school, uh, maybe talk about, oh, you got a Batman shirt on. Oh, my, I love Batman. So does my grandson or whatever. And they just looking at me and I'm you know, talking and then let them do things. Now, I also, if I had to take vital signs, I might tell them to push the button for me, right? On the blood pressure machine. And let's see what number you can get. You can help me. And that makes it fun. Now it becomes play. It doesn't become something that bothers them. A multi. You need to do an assessment on an infant and you walk into the room and the infant is asleep in the mother's arms. What are you gonna do? You have to do an assessment. So we're going to listen to their heart. We're going to listen to their lungs. If we can, we can even listen to their belly because they're quiet. Once an infant wakes up, they're and they're moving and you're not going to hear what you need to hear as well. So it's perfect to do then. 
Don't come back later. Don't lay him down. You're going to wake the kid up. Do it right in mother's arms. I firmly believe doing a lot of things being held by the parent. When do you switch formula to whole milk? Remember I said it, you should absolutely, you know, give breast milk or formula for the first six months of life up to one year. At one year, we do whole milk and it is whole milk. They need the fat. They need that for their central nervous system. We wouldn't put them to skim milk to two years old. So whole milk. How old I? When teaching about car seats for a newborn infant, They're now saying to put them in the middle of the car, not on the, by the door behind the passenger side. So you can look at them, right? <clears throat> if you put them in the middle, you can see them. So your rear view mirror. But it's a gently used one, less than a year. Oh, no problem. New car seats, of course. And you're going to have them rear facing and you're going to have that harness is snug so that they're held in their car seat well. And yeah, you know, there's all sorts of hospitals do all of these car seat checks for parents, especially new parents. Another multi. When and how do you introduce solid foods to infants? Remember I talked to you about children playing with their food and all good for you know cognitive development? Well, that kid loves texture, doesn't he? It's everywhere. I remember my children. After dinner, I let them do that to play with it before their bath time. And they looked just like that one. So we're going to introduce foods one at a time, four to seven days in between. And it's going to be at six months. And we don't do it before because the GI system is not ready for it. Before assessing a four-year-old child, what techniques would you use to approach this child? There's about five questions on that already. So what you're going to do is, you know, you could tell a kid what you're doing, but they're not going to understand. You have to show them with a doll or something um, or let them see equipment. You, you can't just tell them. They're too young at four, but you can start out with breaking the ice, letting them get your trust. Tell them they love that fat man shirt. He's your favorite. You just bought one yourself or, you know, getting them comfortable with you and then let them touch this stuff. And then you will get your assessment done so much quicker by spending a couple minutes in the very beginning. Again, nothing at first. Break the ice, get on their level, get you know, their developmental level, get there and then start playing, talking to them and getting them comfortable and let them touch the stuff. And then you can do anything you want almost. What technique can be used to examine a toddler? <clears throat> so again, your toddlers are ages one to three. And we're going to start using play here. Um, you're not going to go in there and listen and place the stretcher anywhere. Um, it's not a method up or down, head or toe. It's, you're going to do play. So I'm going to say, where is your lungs? And if they don't know, go right here. Let's listen to them here. You listen first. And then I listen to them. And it's a way that you can get everything you need done. And another way to do it is if they're on the mother's lap or the father's lap, that also helps because they feel secure. Nothing will hurt them. When assessing a healthy child's lymph nodes, what should you expect? <clears throat>
you should not feel anything on a healthy child. Lymph nodes will be inflamed and you can feel them when they're sick and have an infection, okay? So you shouldn't feel anything. And we usually think of these here or even in the groin or the armpits, nothing. You should feel nothing. If you do, something's going on, the kid's sick, needs to be seen. Which Erickson stage of developmental levels would you use for a toddler? Remember toddlers, it's all about me, 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 egocentric, right? Me, me, mine, mine, me do. They wanna be autonomous. They wanna do it themselves, but mom and dad, and I know I did it with my grandson. So Nana was like, no, no, be careful. Don't do that. You're gonna hurt yourself. Ah, ah, ah. And it was my husband saying, let him do it. And that he learned to be autonomous. And I learned how to not do things for him. Let him try because that's how he learned. Me holding him back caused more of the shame and the doubt. So letting him go forward to be autonomous, as long as he wasn't hurting himself, was the right thing to do. What pain scale would you use on a three-year-old child? <clears throat> You are going to use faces on a three-year-old. Flack is up to age three. At three, it is faces, okay? This is a question you're gonna see everywhere. Zams, Hesse's, NCLEX. They love this question. So be aware of your pain scales, okay? Flack up to age three and nonverbal children. And flack is gonna be ages three to eight and eight is numeric. A multi. Erickson's autonomy versus shame and doubt is used to describe toddlers. What does this mean? So Children, you know, toddlers should not be playing all by themselves without supervision, okay? They still need somebody watching, but allow them to try new things. They can do things for themselves if we're watching them, but shame is when the parents don't let them try. A two-year-old boy is playing with mud and dirt. What type of play is this? And that's all about the sense, right? It's feeling it, touching it, yes. I used to like to play with mud when I was a kid. I had six brothers though. A parent of an 18 month old boy says he says no to everything and has these rapid mood swings. Is that normal or no? What's going on there? 18 month old, that's a toddler. Toddlers are ages one to three. And absolutely normal, absolutely normal is what we expect with them. Me, 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 my mind, egocentristic, right? They want everything. What is descriptive of a preschooler's understanding of time? Preschooler ages three to five, three to six. Do they understand clocks? What do they understand? They understand events with, um, after this event, after you wake up, we're going somewhere. They don't understand one o'clock, 10 o'clock. They have no clue what that means. When the sun comes up, when the sun goes down, that's what they understand. A four month old infant shake crying and shaking their head. What feature of pain is this infant showing? <clears throat> You can look at that poor baby grimacing, right? Crying, something's going on. 
<clears throat> and it's probably the location. Intensity, we really don't know. Intensity could be the inconsolability or can we console them at all? Is anything gonna console them? Could be intensity, but absolutely they're shaking their head, something's going on. It could be in their ear or maybe in their throat, right? These are things we'd look at. A one month old infant's back of their head is flat. What would you tell the mother? Remember, we're back to sleep today. So you want to get that kid off their head when you can. So when they're wide awake and alert, you have them on their belly because their heads are soft and they will, you know, go round again. I mean, Christian, my poor little grandson, he's a flat head, of course, but with tummy time, his head is perfect today. <coughs> Infants crawl before they walk. This pattern of growth and development is called the lift their head, they turn from front to back, back to front, they crawl, they creep, they walk. What is that? You know, if we look at it, it happens in a certain sequence, right? So it's called sequential trends, okay? Happens in a sequence. Now, it doesn't mean you might not, some kids skip things. They may go from lifting their head to turning from their uh, front to their back or their back to their front first, or they're crawling before they're rolling. This is as long as they're moving forward, they're going in the right direction. Some kids take longer than others too. How do you communicate with parents that do not speak a language you know? I mean, I moved to Miami and I was from a town that there was no other cultures besides an American um, English speaking. So I moved to Miami and I was like, okay, what do I do now? Well, I went to school and did an elementary Spanish course because that's what it's most here. But there are, you know, you have Asian, you have Creole, you have, you know, the Brazilian language. There's all these things I didn't know. There's this blue phone, pick it up and you can do it or have one of your staff members, never a family. And the reason why no family is they're going to interpret what you're saying and give that to the nurse, not the exact meaning. So it has to be through somebody, not family. What age would most children could understand under, on top of, over, under, around, behind, next to? Go get your shoes. They're underneath the couch. It's where you put them. It's four, it's four. Now, any of you who have children and you're thinking of what they said, don't think of your kids, okay? Because I know Christian was three years old doing that. Don't think of other, th don't think of your children. Remember what the book says, it's four. That's the hardest part of peds. In terms of language and cognitive development, a four-year-old child would be expected to do what? <clears throat> A four-year-old child should do simple commands, as in, put your clothes in a dirty laundry, get your clothes off, let's take a bath, put your shoes away, whatever it is, simple commands they should be able to do. What pain scale would you use to assess the pain of a toddler? Toddler, ages one to three. And that's your flack. Bases start after age three. Okay. I think we got that now. A multi. What safety instructions would you teach the parents of a six-month-old child? So what do six-month-old child do that they need to be worried about? What did I say about that?
Well, we know the car seat is rear facing. Yeah, we should cover the electrical outlets because they're starting to crawl, right? Maybe, almost. But again, they're turning over. They're turning over now. They're going to be falling out of beds, changing tables, couches from everywhere um, onto floors. And you'll end up in the emergency room like many parents did. And we never do foods two days apart. It's four to seven days apart for each food, one at a time. What are the cognitive characteristics of a child, two to seven, in the preoperational stage? So they don't really understand other people yet. Not at all, okay? Um, they also, you know, they're um, also, they'll take that stick and be a broom, right? And they're extremely imaginative, but they're not to the point of being logical yet. They couldn't, can't put A and B together and get C. That's older. Now that's school age. That's concrete um, stage of Piaget, okay? A nurse receives a phone call about her six-week-old baby. He's crying a lot every day, and what can she do? So a mother is worried. Her six-week-old baby's crying. What would you tell that mother to do? And then I'll ask you, why is that baby crying all the time? Well, something's going on. So you cannot evaluate, especially these young six-week-old babies. There's no immune system. They haven't got immunizations yet. You don't know what's happening. They need to be examined by a physician, okay? So you're not going to tell them to burp. You're not going to tell them to sit up, all those things. No, have them come in, let them be evaluated. It could be something more than just colic, okay? A multi. What should an infant be able to do at nine months old? So we've learned a lot about what kids can do. You know, let's start to put the pieces together. Well, they should sit without support by eight months old. So it's not with support, okay? It's a tricky question, I know. It was a quick time to be able to think about that. Yes, they should be pulled up on their feet. They should voluntarily grasp something. And absolutely, by six months, they should be rolling completely over. Very good. The first expected fine motor developmental milestone for an infant begins with Remember F, fine fingers. Always think of that when you're answering these questions. F, fine fingers. G, get up and go, go, go. Movement, like Paw Patrol. My grandson loves Paw Patrol. So we start out with a reflex. Remember, mom puts the finger in and the baby by reflex grabs it and says, oh, look, my baby's hugging my finger. We're not going to tell them it's a reflex. <clears throat> a toddler parent asked the nurse for suggestions on dealing with temper tantrums. Who were those toddlers, ages one to three, on the floor, screaming, yelling, crying, carrying on like a crazy person? I love toddlers. <laughs> they really express themselves. Ignore the behavior, um, provided it's not injurious. Leave them alone till it's over? Yes, unless it's injurious, okay? That's the difference between those two answers. A two-year-old has difficulty in activities. They have sensory sensitivity and only speaks one-word responses. How would you assess what's going on with that child? We know by looking at that, one-word responses Difficulty playing, two years old, that's not right. Something's going on. So we need to evaluate to be able to get the proper intervention. 
and it's maybe it's autistic. Okay, and there are tools that we do use because an autistic child's never going to be diagnosed till about two years of age. Okay, up to that point, we suspect, but two years old is when they are given the diagnosis more, and then all the interventions. Parents are concerned her eight month old child's not developing like her older child. Again, what is normal for eight months? I think you know this one now. <clears throat> they sit alone, unsupported. That's an eight month old child. What fine motor skills is expected of a four year old? Again, fine motor, F fingers. Again, reading the question will get you to the answer. At that age, it's buttoning a shirt, tying his shoelaces, though that's later, usually five or six at least. A multi select. What gross motor skills should a four-year-old be able to do? Again, gross, get up and go, go, go. That's motor, that's movement. They're too young still to jump on rope, but they should walk up and down the stairs and hop on one or two feet. That's what they start at four years old. Jumping rope is five or six. RN doing a developmental screening on a 10 month old should expect which fine motor skills from an infant. Again, fine, F, fingers. They should be able to grab that rattle and they could use their pincer grasp, um, grasp right there like that. Now, putting in objects, containers, 11 months. So that's what that, and building a block uh, of two is one year old. Frequent developmental assessments are important for which reason? Like, why do we wanna know if they're walking, crawling, talking, running? using pincer grasp. Why do we want to know any of that? Well, it's gonna identify those delays. We can institute early intervention, which is either speech, physical, occupational therapy, and the beauty of children, a child will catch up quickly. And you'll also at that point, if they're delayed, Let's look at their nutrition. Is the height and the weight where it should be? Are they getting nutrition? Is that why they're falling behind? And again, still with the early intervention. A multi. An infant searches for her toy that's not in sight. What is this? What's it called? <clears throat> she knew it was there a little while ago. Where'd it go? And that is your object permanence, absolutely. And again, that makes a child, they learn and understand and remember very quickly. And again, it makes that child go seek that toy by themselves. So they're using their muscles. The natural physical developmental sequence for most children follow is what? What do they do first as an infant? And then go forward for the first year. Lift their head, roll over, creep, crawl, cruise, and walk. Very good. Another multi. 
which would alert the nurse to hold the digoxin on an infant she's caring for. This question is thrown in here because I want you to understand why you need to know different vital signs on different level of children, because it will affect your care, especially if you're giving a medicine that depends on heart rates, right? But it also goes into the other stuff that we look at with adults. So a heart rate of 90 is too low. Usually it's at 100, they say, hold it. The digoxin level's high and the potassium level's too low. These bounding peripheral pulses have nothing to do with giving digoxin, okay? But your potassium, digoxin level, and heart rate. Apical heart rate for one minute, right? Same thing with infants, children. In general, an infant should triple their birth weight about what months of age? And that's at 12 months, very good. When an infant's toes spread with the soles of the feet are stroked, this is called what? We do this to adults all the time too, don't we? It's the same reflex that continues from infants all the way into adulthood. And that's your Babinski, same thing. Rooting is when you take their chin and stroke it and they go for the bottle or the, the boob, right? Startle or moro is when they, her hands go up, when they have a loud noise or you hit the crib and they get jolted, right? And grasping, we know it's either voluntary or it's that reflex. How do you prevent otitis media in infants? What's well, one of the big things they say? I mean, there's many things we can do. But this is the, like the number one. And it's the smoke. Believe it or not, smoke and otitis media, there's a correlation. You know, um, breastfeeding is always good for sure because of mom's immune system. But smoke, keep smoke away from them for many reasons. When entering into an infant's room, the door slams shut and the infant jerks and starts to cry. What is that reflex called? And that's your moral or startle reflex. Very good. A four-year-old is reluctant to take medicines. What intervention, intervention should the nurse take? I mean, this is a really common problem when you have some kids, they don't want medicines for whatever reason, and they'll fight you tooth and nail. And what is said is you just go ahead, okay, I have to give you a medicine. You want the liquid or you want to chew a pill? All right, you want the liquid? Should I put it in a cup or a spoon? Or you want to squirt it in your mouth with a syringe? Straightforward, don't let them make any, you know, no, 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 not this like that. Just say what you want. And when you're done, I'll give you a popsicle, right? That will get it through to them. Which intervention helps a hospitalized toddler feel that sense of control? They'll be calmer, they'll be happier. Keep them on their schedule, right? Just like vacation, if you can. Some vacations don't work that way. Hospital, we can. A three-month-old infant does not sleep through the night. What finding is most significant why they're not sleeping through the night? It's that diaper rash. Can you imagine having open a braised skin? It's like a uh, number one degree burn, right? It's like the skin is gone. And then you put urine or stool on it, it burns and it wakes these kids up. 
An art assessing a two and a half year old toddler, what findings should you report to the provider? When the head circumference is more than the chest, there's a problem and it really needs to be investigated. A multi. What are risk factors for SIDS? Sudden infant death syndrome. Males more than females smoke and a recent viral illness. If you're breastfeeding, your risks are decreased drastically. And what does the rooting reflex enable the infant to do? The rooty toot tutor, right? And that's breast or bottle feed. Many times uh, newer infants don't understand. So you stroke their cheek and it's a reflex and they'll go and they'll look for something. And that's how we would teach new breastfeeding mothers to do. A multi. A child's been admitted with profuse diarrhea for two days. What would you expect? Now, what I've noticed, there's been a lot of acid-base questions on your HESI. And that being said, I'm trying to let you understand acid-base balance due to different diagnoses in children. And you're gonna see this a lot of, in a lot of cahoots. So getting you to understand. So when you have diarrhea, diarrhea has a lot of alkaline in it because of all of the digestive enzymes. So you lose alkaline, what is left? Acid. So you are in metabolic acidosis. Now, losing any liquid, hypokalemia, is what you worry about. So that's why it's that too, okay? So if you're not understanding acid base, I'm going to be doing them over and over again or meet with me. I'll tell you very easily how to do it. Normal language skills for a three-year-old child would be what? How should they be speaking by three? <clears throat> They're about a four word sentence by that right now. Some are more, some are less, but about four words for a sentence. An infant's unable to take a breast or bottle for feedings and what is important to remember? Now it could be due to the patient condition, their NPO, they can't eat, but we have to maintain growth and development. How does an infant deal with all the stress of not eating? and we're gonna give them a pacifier. Now, if their NPO is for a reason, nothing in the mouth, not vig vigorous mouth care, no, you're stimulating a lot of mucus in there, just a pacifier, and it does self-soothe the child. And last question, what does an infant start to do at three months? Very easily, three months, what are they doing? They're gonna be able to roll over. They're gonna start that. You know, you'll see a little bit of it. And we know that their head's gonna be already up by two months, but they're gonna be starting to roll over. All right, let's see how we did today. Number three, Jessica, good job, Jess. Number two, Ashley. Number one, Sam, good job, Sam. Number four. Gina, China, and Renee. Sorry, China. All right, what I want you to do is ask any questions you need to know. I'll be sending you something uh, within the next hour or so, what we can do for this quiz to make it up. Um, I'll be something very quick that you can get done by next week, okay? Any questions I can help anybody with?
Thank you everybody for another great meeting. I'll see you all next week. And I'll be sending out all the review stuff for you. Try to attend at least one, if not two, because actually a live review, somehow you're paying more attention to it, okay? And it does help. And you'll be getting those PowerPoints by um, Friday night, okay? Have a good night, guys. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs>